One of the things that comes up pretty much any time I talk to anyone about films <laughs> is what I call, or has been called, the easy riders to Raging Bulls period. And through our prior discussions and discussions with other people, I've kind of worked out that it's somewhere, in fact, between Bonnie and Clyde or The Graduate, which is 67, which is two years before Easy Rider. And it goes up mm -hmm. to about Raging Bull and probably the film Heaven's Gate, which I've never seen, but which apparently nearly bankrupted the studio. I don't remember the studio, but... Um, so, you know, the way I would characterize that period is that it was an amazing time. I mean, obviously you had the 60s in music, and I feel like new Hollywood, if you want to call it that, the Hollywood new wave, it kind of followed four or five years behind the music, perhaps. I don't know. That's probably debatable. But I feel like it was a period where you had the first film schools. So you had, you know, Scorsese, Coppola, De Palma. I don't know if Spielberg went to film school. But anyway, they're coming out of film school. It was also a period right. where the film execs were doing a little too much of the Colombian marching powder, and they kind of <laughs> <laughs> took their eye off the ball, as we'd say in England. I'd probably say that anyway. You know, the director started to get a bit more power, and I think it was just a sort of liberal, not politically liberal necessarily, because Nixon was in the White House, but liberal small L feeling of kind of anything goes. So all these film school guys, the film brats, as they called them, you know, been studying Russian and German expressionist cinema, French New Wave, Italian neo-noir, that kind of thing. Right. So you, you had this amazing run of 10 years or so of films that kind of looked a lot like documentaries. I mean, you told me you watched French Connection recently. That's a very good example. You know, it's got long track. Yes. Stuff. So are you very familiar with that period of film? And would that be among your favorites, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I would say it's interesting to look at my list and, and without giving away my top, top films in the order that I'm going to be presenting in my countdown. It's interesting when I look over my films that are really, let's say we're kind of discussing our sort of what's in our top hundred films. Mm -hmm. And I look at the dates of those films and it's a really interesting combination of years. And I think I've really tried to be objective in looking. I think it's important when you look at a film to also understand the time range and what was sort of happening in the world, not only happening in the world, but happening in the micro world of film. And as you say, the American new wave, as you call it, really kind of followed, you know, the Italian new wave and then the French new wave. And it's interesting, I think, some of my favorite films are from the 50s. I have a mm. really good handful of films that I think were even cutting ground. And of course, they were coming out of the neorealism, the Italian movement, especially with some of just the, you mentioned Nebraska being a quiet film. And mm -hmm. I think that was sort of the approach. And you can still see the effects of that. Italian neorealism, more showing. You were saying long shots. I think the idea yeah. that you show, you tell through the pictures and sort of the tone of the film. And yeah. so I think, you know, obviously going into the 60s, I mean, it was a big cultural revolution happening. And I think American studios started to take more risks films of that time era were very cookie cutter. They were very formulaic. They followed a, a very safe platform. And I think as the 60s started changing these things, newer directors started coming in, newer actors that started trying things. And of course, the studio, like you said, if they were on a runaway coke train, they sort of just allowed directors and filmmakers to experiment and, and to sort of rethink the way films were shot. And I think we, we got some great films through the 60s and 70s. I mean, if you're saying the Easy Rider or the Graduate period to Raging mm. Bull, I mean, that covers a good 15 to 20 year period there. I think dominated by the 70s, though, really. I agree 100%. My top mm. films are really like just even in my top 20 i would say probably like half of them are from the 70s and some of those films when i was really just too young to understand what they were all about or you know wasn't allowed to see them at that time you know yeah. when i was a kid but to me looking back retrospectively they are the best films the top period in my opinion the 70s 
Yeah. My like film education was strange because I mean, strange in a good way, because I, I had a school friend whose name is Edmund, who I'll get to listen to this because he loves films as well. And his mother had an incredible VHS, as it was then, collection. <laughs> For the kids out there, that's a kind of clunky version of a DVD. <laughs> and she had all this old stuff. And nobody was forcing me to watch Hitchcock and, you know, 50 sci-fi, mm-hmm. like Invasion of the Body Snatchers and The Incredible Shrinking Man. Mm-hmm. I, I voluntarily watched those. And we kind of raided my friend's mother's VHS collection, as I said. You know, and I was being exposed to, you know, I mean, I loved Rear Window when I was like 13. It's ridiculous. And Mm -hmm. I remember watching The Deer Hunter when I was at probably 13, 14, the same, when I was at school. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's impacted my life particularly, because musically I was sort of into the stuff any 13, 14 year old was into. But film, I kind of had a bit of an edge going on there. And um, I don't want to give away your list, uh, Jay Crush, but if I could just give the give the audience a few examples of ones that would perhaps be on both of our lists. Sure. And any of these that you don't want to reveal, we'll, we'll cut out in editing. But, you know, from this Easy Riders Raging Bulls, I mean, typical examples would be One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Jaws, which I know is, isn't on your list. That would be on my list, but that's perhaps more sentimental as well as it being a great film. But, you know, Midnight Cowboy, Marathon sure. Man, and then the graduate you and I have discussed. And interestingly, yeah. three films with Dustin Hoffman. So that kind of oh, yeah. <laughs> that kind of does give you an idea of the impact of his acting. Just the types of films that he's done. That's interesting because I didn't do that intentionally at all. I was just kind of scanning the list you gave me. But well, other- right. I don't. I don't think you do that consciously. The roles that he was able to play, the diversity that he showed in his roles. You're not thinking, Dustin Hoffman's my favorite actor, therefore I like these films. It's more like you like these films and then you realize, you know, one of the common denominators is Dustin Hoffman, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's other ones, of course. I mean, obviously, you know, De Niro, Pacino, Jack Nicholson are all over this period. Warren Beatty, I've never really understood the fuss. I know he was kind of a big personality in Hollywood and he was also a producer, wasn't he? But I'm not quite understanding... I like Bonnie and Clyde. Well, he was he was a hunk of the time period. Right. He well. he was the hunk, and I mean, you know, his first role was alongside Natalie Wood, I believe, in Splendor in the in the Grass, and that was a film that was really looking at sexual taboos and, and kind of things like that, and how they were coming out of a period of conservatism, sexual conservatism into the sexual Mm -hmm. revolution that happened in the 60s. And he was, Mm -hmm. you know, in the eyes of the culture at the time, just the pinnacle of of handsomeness and things like that. And he did another film that I actually think is a really good film. It's called All Fall Down. And yeah, I highly recommend that one. I think he did that after Splendor in the Grass. And so I think he does have a place there somewhere. Um, Mm. And of course he directed Reds, which was one of the top films of the year, according to the Academy at that time. Um, It's early eighties, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, And you know what, to be honest too, I think the heaven can wait remake that he did with Julie Christie I believe it was late 70s. I think it's just a great film. It's one of my all-time favorite films. Maybe not in my mm. top 100. So I think, yeah, Warren Betty wasn't as, let's say, cutting edge as maybe, you know, a De Niro or a, a Jack Nicholson, somebody like that. But he, he definitely played a part. Yeah, another example, obviously, of the 70s is, is Taxi Driver and then Raging Bull, of course. Sure. I think Raging Bull is... Uh, Sorry for the pun, but Pound for Pound, my favorite film. <laughs> That's obviously a film which is in the world of boxing. Uh, Rocky, of course, is another one. I, I do like the original Rocky. They got a bit cartoony as they went on, but they were always good fun when I was a kid. But um, yeah, Raging Bull is about ostensibly about boxing, but Scorsese wasn't really a boxing fan. Um, and so he decided that the ring, the boxing ring, was you know the traps that we put ourselves in or the traps we're in in our lives. And, all became metaphorical you know almost like the shark in jaws in a way 
I'm sure a lot of the audience will know the mechanical shark didn't work, so they decided to keep the shark under the water, and you didn't see it for nearly an hour. Right. But know? it still scared the shit out of you. Sure. Obviously, that was a nod back to, to Psycho. You know, they were kind of trying to do what Psycho did for the shower. They did it for the ocean. Yeah. Before that period, you know, really, for me, Hitchcock all the way, and Stanley Kubrick was kind of before that period, and then he was in that period with Clockwork Orange, but I guess Barry Lyndon didn't quite fit that 70s thing, although I love it as a film. I do too. And then, of course, The Shining as well. So you've got Jack Nicholson, the worlds of Kubrick and Nicholson meeting, which was interesting. 